Good evening. My name is Paul Holden Graeber, and I'm the director of public programs at the New York Public Library, known as Live from the New York Public Library. As most of you, I think, by now know, my goal here at the library, apart from pro providing you with cognitive theater, is simply to make the lions roar, to make this great institution levitate. To help us achieve this goal, we have tonight Christopher Hitchens. Hitch. I should have paused there. Hitch, as you will discover, he's a Times called, asked me to be brief. Not my forte. You know, the famous line of Pascal, if I had had more time, I would have made it shorter. I will, though, do my best. No bio here, as we are here to speak precisely about the man himself, his memoir, Hitch 22. But I have to tell you what is coming up briefly. On Monday, our very first evening in Bryant Park, pray that it does not rain, I will speak with John Waters, he loves no one more, you will discover if you come, than Johnny Mattis. On Tuesday, the photographer Lena Herzog will be here to discuss Lost Souls, her haunting photographs. I encourage you all to see her exhibition of Lost Souls on view now at the International Center for Photography, Our Neighbors in Mid-Manhattan. We will end the season with an evening on soccer. Stay tuned for that one, as well as news about our upcoming season, fall season, which will include conversations with Supreme Court Justice Stephen Breyer, Edwidge Danticat, Antonio Frazier, Derek Walcott, Nicole Krauss with David Grossman, Zadie Smith, Angela Davis with Toni Morrison, and many others. Libraries, as Christopher Hitchens knows very well, matter greatly to our democracy. Did you know that Keith Richards, one of the founding members of the Rolling Stones, is writing his memoir due out in October? In it, he confesses, I wonder what Hitch will think about this, in it he confesses his secret longing to be a librarian. When I'm not... I'm not wondering what Hitch thinks about that. I think that he would think that that is a very good thing and noble thing to be, but he says this. When you were growing up, Keith Richards writes, there are two institutional places that affect you most powerfully. The church, which belongs to God, and the public library that belongs to you. The public library, he says, is a great equalizer. I plan to invite Keith Richards to be on stage, indeed I have already invited him, to come to discuss, among other things, the role of libraries. I think we have other things to discuss with Keith Richards. But I will also talk to him about the role of libraries in our democracy. I urge you to become a supporter of the New York Public Library. Here is my plea. Be it a young lion, if you are young enough or feel young enough, or a conservator, or consider becoming part of the President's Council. The New York Public Library is in the middle of a campaign. Don't close the books on libraries. The New York Public Library is facing, if you didn't know it, the harshest cut in its history. A proposed city budget right now, a reduction of $37 million that could shut down 10 branches as of July and slash service to just four days a week. You can immediately support the library. By immediately, I mean now. I'm going to show you how. You can immediately support the library and its mission with a simple text message. So, take out your phones now. I'll ask you to shut them later. And text NYPL to the number 27722 to give $10 from your mobile phone. You, when Prompted reply yes to complete this one-time gift. Again, that is NYPL 27722. Don't see many people with phones out. <laughs> a one-time $10 donation will appear on your next mobile bill as a separate line item and is recognized as a tax-deductible donation. Thank you for your support. Flyers should indeed be on your chairs if you wish to take care of this later or, as probably most of you will do, donate several times. 
Our wonderful independent bookseller will have Hitch 22 available for purchase. Christopher Hitchens has graciously agreed to sign his memoir after our conversation. Our wonderful bookseller is 192 Books. It is now finally, and this was not all too brief, I know, Christopher, I'm sorry, a pleasure to welcome Christopher Hitchens back to the stage. Last time he debated his last book, God is Not Great, with Reverend Al Sharpton. They entered the room to Gregorian chant, I don't know if you remember that, and took to the stage with James Brown. You entered tonight uh, to the music mostly of Bob Dylan, which Hitchens loves. Tonight, please warmly welcome Hitch to the stage, to the music of Fats Waller, Your Feet's Too Big. We will explain why. Ladies and gentlemen, Christopher Hitchens and Fats Waller. <laughs> Sounds like baby powder. Baby elephant powder, that's what I call it. Say, up in Harlem, at a table for two. There were four of us, me, your big feet, and you. From your ankle up, I'll say you show sure are sweet. From that down, there's just too much feet. Yes, your feet's too big. Don't want you cause your feet's too big. Can't use you cause your feet's too big. I really hate you cause your feet's too big. Yeah. I know, it's, wow, it, it's, wow, wow, it, wow. it's a shame to talk after that, but here we are to do that. And um, your feet's too big. I didn't mean that about you, but you write about your father, the commander. He disliked coming to London on principle as at, and had enraged me when I was younger by refusing to take a job as a secretary of Brooks Club. I would have been living in London in Mayfair for heaven's sake and when I was a teenager, exclamation point. Mm. But I did once lure, lure him to the detested city to see a musical about Fats Waller, an uncharacteristic favorite of his, Your Feet's Too Big. And he once astonished me by asking in the late 1970s if I'd care to come with him to the reunion of old shipmates, and on and on and on. Tell us something about your father and... Mm. Maybe what you remember about that musical when you went with your father. Give us a portrait of him, if you would. Well, the old man, who we used to call the commander affectionately because it was the highest rank uh, to which he attained in the Royal Navy, in which he'd served all his life, um, was a rather inward, uh, slightly morose man who had the virtues of thrift and um, honesty and uh, also courage. Um, during the course of the Second World War, he, in which he told me one of his very few confiding remarks. He said that when he was fighting the Nazis, it was the only time in his entire life he felt he knew what he was doing. <laughs> it didn't occur to me until later that didn't, it meant he didn't know what he was doing when, say, he had a son in 1949 or uh, things like that. But I, I would have, that would have been, a, to me, a trivial remark because I was brought up entirely on the history of British wartime valor. And we used to have a toast every Boxing Day, the day after Christmas. Because on that day in 1943, his ship, HMS Jamaica, had sent uh, a big Nazi convoy raiding pocket battleship called the Scharnhorst to the bottom of the sea, um, which is a better day's work, as I say in the book, than any I've ever done myself. And I still have a toast every Boxing Day for that reason. But in fact, in a funny way, he didn't know what he was doing. I mean, it wasn't under his control to know that because he certainly had not joined His Majesty's Royal Navy in order to be running guns to Joseph Stalin, which was what he was, in fact, doing, escorting those convoys over the hump of Scandinavia to the Russian ports of Murmansk and Archangel. And, in fact, his entire life was lived slightly as someone who was taken advantage of by the establishment to which he was so devoted. So 
I felt sorry for him when I was growing up, which is probably not a terrifically good thing to feel for your old man, because he'd been so loyal to the crown, the empire, the Tory party, the navy, and he'd got nothing out of it. And as people used to say, he was Tory, but nothing to be Tory about. And he was left on the beach. Uh, after the war, they downsized the navy and let him go. And he was never the same again. I hope I'm not going on too much about this, but you did ask. And it's very informative on me because it strikes me all the time that the ruling class <coughs> has this permanent reservoir of people who are very loyal to it and get nothing in return um, and who are, in a sense, being exploited. And that had a very important influence on moving me to the, to the left when I was young. Do you remember? Oh, and um, yes, he did, have remember a fondness, he did have a fondness for old-style jazz. And he liked his, one of his favorite songs was My Very Good Friend, The Milkman which I still can't hear without emotion, and then your feet's too big, of all things. And then when he took me, um, he came to London because he was going to his, the last reunion, I could tell it was going to be the last, of his old shipmates. They were gathering in some broken down old Navy club. And we, we went along, and he, he asked me if I'd come. I was amazed. I never thought he'd ask me to a thing like that. I thought I'd been a disappointment to him. But there they all were, these old sea dogs, gathered for the last time. And they all called him Hitch, which I'd never heard anyone be called before, which was what my friends were starting to call me. So there was, a, <clears throat> at the last, a slight male bond between um, me and the commander. The commander and me, I should say. Sorry. <laughs> and for some reason, this name has stuck with you. You make a lot in the book about how important your name was going to be for you. Oh, yeah. I mean, if you're growing up in a lower middle class family that's desperately trying to escape the class below it, and your family name is Hitchens, and your name is Christopher, first name, if people start calling you Chris, to be matey, say, it's Chris Hitchens at first, but it's Chris Hitchens quite soon. A whole aspirate has dropped out of the equation. And then you're in danger of being common, vulgar. My mother wouldn't have any of that. Um, and I more or less promised her. I wouldn't allow it. So, but people kept doing it. They st still do because they think it's friendly. Hi, Chris. No, thank you. Would you mind? I, I'm against circumcision of all kinds <laughs> and amputation of children. And so I'll stick to this nice name. Oh, good. Uh, actually, I thought I would get more applause, but there. Um, it, sh it should, if anyone wants to saw off bits of their genitalia, they should do it when they're grown up and have made the decision How for did themselves. You get there? Um, <laughs> Well, it had to come because uh, that's part of the family secret, too. I didn't know my mother was Jewish. I thought I was circumcised for the same reason as all other middle class boys, and I still sometimes brood on the missing bits. <laughs> um, but that's getting ahead, too. Um, it, 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 so, so the constant... So I write... It's also part of the second identity or split personality or uh, divided self that I write about throughout the book, which is the theme of it. I nearly called it both sides. Now I'm glad I didn't. Um, Were you but it would have been a good enough working title. Uh, I was, when I was at university, I was Chris during the working day. In other words, I was wearing a donkey jacket and giving out leaflets outside the car factories and waving the flag of the Viet Cong and other things that I would do again proudly. But in the evening, thinking life isn't all politics, I would be Christopher and I'd put on a dinner jacket and try and have a, a sort time. of bride's head regurgitated. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Good time, which I thought I was entitled to after something like 12 years of being stuck in a monastic boys-only school. Which um, was not all pleasure. So Hitch is a perfect solution to the Chris Christopher problem. It's ideal. Um, though it is a circumcision of Hitchens, I will admit. Actually, that thought hadn't occurred to me till this minute. <laughs> Damn. Well, um, there you go. There is a second edition, Yeah, maybe. nothing comes Absolutely. for free. Yeah. Um, you... You, you spoke earlier uh, early about your, the, the impact your, your father had on you, a man of few words, something one probably wouldn't likely say about you. Um, and um, I think we can, we can move uh, quite elegantly from having this father who was rather laconic to your own experience of being a father. And it's something that doesn't feature very much in your book, but when it does, it does so quite pungently. I think here, 
um, we learned something about you. For the people who didn't know you before under that guise, we learned something. And I'd like you, um, Hitch, uh, to read this little passage, if you don't mind. Do you, do you need glasses? Yes, I do, but I don't seem to have them. Hold on. Oh, yes, I do. You do. Those are dark. I should have prepared you. No, you should have done. It's all right. I found them. Good. Yes. If you don't mind, you, you told me you wouldn't mind reading, and I think in, your, in your, your own words, read by you might be better than by me. If you could read from there to there. Good grief. <laughs> Do you want to read less? Yes. <laughs> Beginning with my deep. I was going to begin right the last line yes. there. I should just prepare you for this by saying that um, I tell various anecdotes about my father, all of them very terse. One of them, which I forgot to put in, so I'll tell you now, is when I, he used to get up very early, which I've never been able to do, my, neither my mother, make himself breakfast down in the kitchen with the old coal range and baked eggs and strong tea and so forth. And I thought one morning it might be nice if I went down, I happened to be up early, for God knows what reason, have breakfast with the old man. So I put on my corduroy shorts and so on and toddled down the stairs. And then, morning, Daddy, and he looked up and said, Jesus Christ, there'll be family prayers next. <laughs> from this you may get an impression uh, also of his uh, it's also how I learned what his Baptist upbringing had probably been like so, and I never I don't think I've ever had breakfast voluntarily ever since actually um, okay so these you try to think well you won't be like that with your own kids you'll be much more warm supportive you know might even have breakfast with them so this is the bit you want me to read my deep vice of lack of patience had its worst outcome, I feel sure, in the raising of my children. Many men feel somewhat useless during the early childhood of their offspring, as well as paralyzed with admiration for the way that women seem somehow to know what to do when the babies arrive. I don't think I can take refuge in the general weakness of my sex. Confronted with infancy, I was exceptionally no good. Anything I don't say here is only intended to spare others, not myself. Like not a few men, I set myself to overcompensate by working over harder, which I think has its own justification in the biologically essential task of feeding and clothing and educating one's young, but I was really marking time till they were old enough to be able to hold a conversation. And I have to face the fact that the children of both my marriages learn much, much more about manhood and nurturing from their grandparents, my magnificent in-laws, than they did from me. That's one lapse and not just a lapse in time that I know I shall not make up for. One cannot invent memories for other people. And the father figure for my children must be indistinct at best until quite late in their lives. There are days when this gives me inexpressible pain, and I know that such days of remorse also lie in my future. I distinguish remorse from regret in that remorse is sorrow for what one did do, whereas regret is misery for what one did not do. Both seem to be involved in this case. My only recourse, my promise and vow, was and is to get a bit better as they get older. Hence this example, which I hope I'll be able to improve upon before they come and screw down the lid, or whatever it is. And that's where you want me to start, wisely. Yes. <laughs> that's an admission. Yeah. A very strong one. Yes. And it was in case, you know, I didn't live to see the publication of the book. I felt that I would leave a message in a bottle, that kind of thing. <laughs> Something for them. Have you become better? Uh, you should ask them. Uh, but yes, I think so. Yeah. And the, uh, with the young adult, I think I'm not bad. I mean, I know I'm not bad as a teacher. I, I get quite a lot of letters from uh, students that I've had telling me of their progress. Uh, of the age of my, at least my older children are now. People want to come and visit me. I always try and, I always try and say yes. Um, and I even wrote a book, which I know had some success. It, 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 I don't quite know why it worked as well as it did. It's called Letters to a Young Contrary and Fatuous Term. But um, it was a, letters, um, a word letters you've to, been associated letters, with. Advice to the young, anyway. Yeah, which I, you, you don't like that word, contrarian? No. I don't. In fact, I didn't, at least I was true to the title by denouncing the word contrarian as stupid in the first paragraph. The publishers insisted on it. I, I was asked the other day in Los Angeles at a book signing by a, an older man, came up with a copy of the book and asked me to sign it, and he said, 
while he waited, he said, I first bought this book for my son to give it to him in the hope he'd become a contrarian, but he refused. <laughs> <laughs> he said it just like that. I said, I know what you're going through. Well, that does bring us back to, to what you were reading. Um, I love the way the book begins. I really do. Um, I love it because in part of the quotations you use, the epigrams you use at the beginning, and particularly one that comes from Leo, Leopold Bloom, yes. um, where you say, read your own obituary notice, they say you live longer, gives you second wind, new lease of life. I yes. see a little yes. smile there. Gives you a second wind, new lease on life. Yeah, well, I... It you, helped. you love obituary. When I was Obituaries. wondering whether to do a memoir at all, I got a hysterically apologetic letter from a wonderful man called Sandy Nairn, who some of you may have heard of. He's the director of the National Portrait Gallery in London. And he, it began, Dear Mr. Hitchens, we can't apologize enough. We don't know what to say to you. And went on in this way. It, it turned out that they produced a catalog for an exhibition of photographs of a group of people young people, younger people, of whom I used to be a set, if you like, of whom I used to be, of which I used to be a member. Uh, actually, its title was The Friends of Martin Amis. And um, it was quite a hit at the National Portrait Gallery, and they'd sent out this catalogue in which one of the captions read, um, Martin Amis with the late Christopher Hitchens. <laughs> so let me just tell you something. When you s read about yourself in the past tense, it does concentrate the mind. And he flailed on and said, the copies will all be pulped, most of them have been withdrawn, but some of them did get out of subscribers, we don't know how to... I think he thought I was going to sue. I'm not late, mate. And it's professionally damaging to be told you're dead, because then people won't ask you to write books or review so them. You, yeah. so, you, so, so in fact, you, you didn't sue, but you wrote. So that's why we haven't seen Hitch around lately, right. and you know, it, it, it's bad. So it's, in bold contrast, I wrote back to him saying, don't you dare destroy these things. I want, I want at least six copies now. And I had to see it for myself, and there it was. Um, and then and I there you were in extremely good company with Mark Twain and so many others. Mark Twain, Alfred Nobel, it changed his life. When Nobel read his obituaries, he read that he'd been a warmonger and a dynamite maker. So he went straight and endorsed a boring peace prize. Um, Ernest Hemingway used to read the obituaries every morning with a cocktail to cheer himself up. It only worked for about 10 years, but <laughs> before he... <laughs> unship the shotgun, but it, it, it probably bought him, <laughs> bought him 10 years. Um, the great, uh, oh, there are various people. Um, Marcus Garvey, the founder of the Back to Africa movement, on, in bold contrast, founder of Harlem nationalism, died of an apoplectic fit while reading his obituary. Um, so it doesn't always strike everyone the same. On me, it did have a cheering effect, though, though um, nonetheless, you read a sentence that will one day be unarguably true, and, well, you see that words are, are powerful, potent. Very. Uh, we once did a program here at, uh, at Live from the New York Public Library, naturally called Live from the New York Public Library Presents Dead from the New York yes. Public Library, because I'm, I'm rather interested myself also in mm. obituaries. And we, we had in the, in the audience... Um, I, I was interviewing the great obituary writer for The Economist, Anne Rowe, yeah. and in the audience we had half of the New York Times undertakers. And, um, <laughs> and they, were, they were comparing how they did the dead. Um, and interestingly enough, um, the New York Times dines out, I'm told, um, with some of their future featured people to... And some of yeah. those featured, featured people, <clears throat> when they are smart and shrewd, realize that they better be good at that lunch sure. or dinner because it will reflect Weave well. Weave an epigram in here and there. Yeah. You know, I once met Sir Stephen Runciman, who some of you may have read. He was the great historian of the Crusades and of Byzantium. And he was still alive. This was in the late 70s, having been at Eton with George Orwell and Cyril Connolly. He was the last survivor of that class. And I met him at a conference on, on Byzantium in Cyprus and was amazed to meet one of my heroes in this way. And he said, um, I suppose I look very old and crumbling to you, decrepit. And I, I just was thinking how true that was. <laughs> and I said, but Sir Stephen, by no means, of course not. Um, and he said, well, I'll tell you what, one thing. I'm not going to die. I'm not going to. 
And I said, well, I'm delighted to hear it, Sir Stephen. And he said, the Times at this point, the London Times, which really invents the obituary stuff, had been locked out by Rupert Murdoch, hadn't appeared for a year and a half. He said, I'm not dying till the Times comes back and I get my full dress <laughs> obituary. And when the London Times came back from the long lockout, the first thing it did was to publish the Times obituary supplement to do justice to all the old buffers who died and not had their column in the paper. Um, you is know, this a bit morbid of us, do you think? No, not at all. Um, okay. Uh, well, to cheer us up, I love Bob Hope's line that when he was dying, uh, his wife asked him where, where he should be buried, and he said, surprise me. Yes. Uh, but but um, <laughs> what, what... Well, that's it. It's actually in my book as well about people. I want, there was once a rumor of Bob Hope's death, and for some reason, the Associated Press called me up and said, had I heard that Bob Hope had died, and I'd just seen him at the British Embassy at a reception in his honor, because he'd been born in Eltham in Middlesex two weeks before, and I now wish I hadn't said, well, he looked dead enough when I saw him last. It's, I think now that was a low blow for the old buzzer. It, I, don't think it, I don't think the subject of death is particularly morbid, but, or no, that obituaries no. are necessarily, but I would say one thing that um, haunts me in the very first five pages, which I had diligently prepared to read, but it would take us, I think, a little bit too long, um, in the first four or five pages of uh, your memoir, one thing that strikes me, and maybe you can address this in this company here, is a real fear of death. And in some way, I think that the memoir is written to, to hold it at bay to some extent. For sure. I mean, I'm, I'm very acutely aware that every day, now that I've passed 61, is more and more subtracted out of less and less, of course. And I've always known, just as a matter of objectivity, that I'm born into a losing struggle. We all know that. I mean, when one has taken a glimpse down the road, and I, I don't know anyone who's come out of this a winner. It's not likely to happen. And we're beset on all sides by people who promise us release from this consideration or remission from it, and dangerous, nasty people, stupid people, who want to be a pain in the ass to you while you're still alive, and not content to try and torment you after your demise. So that keeps one going. You want to stay alive, if only to uh, combat the, the merchants of, of death who promise, falsely promise eternal life. Has, again, rather muted, I felt. <laughs> Has the, has, the, has, the, has the writing of this memoir... In well, it? Nadine Gordimer, okay. I, I know what I wanted to say, once wrote, I, I, couldn't, I could never find exactly where it is, but she told me she had certainly said it. I saw her just last week in, in Hay on Why, incredible, by the way, and she's just produced a, a, a collection of her non-fictional writing. She once wrote, and it made a, a huge effect on me, that, that one should, tr or said, that one should try to write as if posthumously. And to try and picture yourself writing post-mortem because then you're free of all the inhibitions that can cluster around even the most independent-minded writer, as he may think of himself. You don't, you're not going to care about public opinion now. You don't mind about sales. You don't care what the critics say. You don't even care what your friends, your peers, your beloved, beloved think. You're, you're free. Death is a very liberating thought. Um, that's the way I would prefer to think about it. And I don't think I write as if I'm scared of it. I certainly hope I don't give that impression. I think it's, it's quite uh, emancipating to be able to think of it in a, in a clear-eyed way. I was going to say that um, it, it seems also that the, maybe the writing of this... In any way, I, it, it, I, I certainly know I was cheered up by reading about my death. I know that. And I didn't know that that would be my reaction. But that, you would say, was the seed for writing this memoir? Without question, yes. So well, because it abolishes the old question you get asked all the time, isn't it a bit too soon? You say, well, I can't leave it too late, mate. <laughs> that takes care of itself. That's done. You know, writing for posterity reminds me of a, a memoir that I've always loved. I I'm, I'm, don't know if, if it's among the things you love reading, which is um, Stendhal's The Life of Henri Brulard. He writes for the happy few, for the future 
reader, for the reader who will read him in 70 years from now, enjoying the fact that in some way he is, as you said, not inhibited. That's how pre, pre, that's pre posthumous how, in some way. That's how Winston Smith opens his diary in 1984, almost in those words, probably not by accident. It's exactly how it begins. So the memoir is written, uh, you, you quote Paul Cavafy at one moment, the itch to scribble. Yes. You have this, this urge in some way to write your life. And I don't know if no, you make... No, 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 not just the life, just to write. In, but in this particular Ca case... Cacoethia scribendi, yes, the, itch, the urge, the itch to scribble. I knew when I was quite young that not that it was what I wanted to do or would like to do. But you had to do. Had to do, yeah. The auto, is this an autobiography in any no. form? No. Because in autobiographies, there's an autobiographane, the fact yes. that you, in some way, come to life through the act of writing. It's a memoir, and you make a distinction that you think it's is important? It's a memoir, and it's an attempt to locate myself and make myself more presentable by... More presentable? Yes, by um, scraping acquaintance with charming friends and putting myself in the same company as them, finding myself in interesting countries at times of war and crisis and revolution. So I, I always have to have an excuse for writing about myself um, un until I do the Proust questionnaire towards the end and I just say, you might want to know a bit about what I'm like. All the other things are, I happened to be in Poland just when the Solidarity Movement was beginning. You, you, I you, thought I saw it coming. I met this guy who later became famous. I always feel I need a justification of that sort. And even when I write about the death of my, my, um, my beloved mother, it's a, it was a help to me, if, I, if this doesn't sound profane, that the week that I had to go and investigate her death was a week when the tanks were in the streets of Athens and there was a counter-revolution and a coup and blood in the streets and people I knew tortured and killed. And, um, and I had to deal with the coroner, who was the same coroner in, you, everyone here I hope remembers Costa Gavras' film Z said, uh, the same coroner who had returned the false verdict in the murder of Lambrakis. So even, even there I felt I, I need to, I'm trying to locate myself, perhaps futilely, in modern events. I won't say history. Uh, I don't know if I, I'll have you read that passage about your mother's death, but I will read um, it. Okay. At all events, this is how it ends. I'm eventually escorted to the hotel suite where it all had happened. Two bodies had had to be removed and their coffins sealed before I could get there. This was so dismally sordid reason that the dead couple had taken a while to be discovered. The pain, this is so piercing and exquisite, and the scenery of the two rooms so nasty and so tawdry that I hide my tears and my nausea by pretending to seek some air at the window. And there, for the first time, I receive a shattering full-on view of the Acropolis for a moment and like the Berlin Wall and other celebrated vistas then when glimpsed for the first time, it almost resembles some remembered postcard of itself. But then it becomes utterly authentic and unique. That temple really must be the Parthenon and almost near enough to stretch out and touch. The room behind me is full of death and darkness and depression, but suddenly here again and fully present is a flash and dazzle and brilliance of the green, blue and white of the life-giving Mediterranean air and light that lent me my first hope and confidence. I only wish I could have been clutching my mother's hand for this too. Yes, thank you. It's an extraordinary, extraordinary passage, well, rather painful, um, um, but you immediately mm -hmm. go from the scene which you might describe as to what happened to antiquity. Yes. to an area of the world that you're interested in in many different ways. And to civilization as opposed to primitive and barbaric uh, episodes. And it's also, as you know, it's a, it's a coda because I opened the chapter about my mother remembering my first 
my first memory, recollecting actually my first, which is of the Mediterranean, it's the Grand Harbour at Valletta, first thing I can yeah. remember, crossing, three. when I was three or so, crossing the harbour with her on a ferry and seeing this dazzling Baroque Renaissance city, white, coming down to the shore, very azure, cerulean Mediterranean, and then the different colours of the sky, and then the blending of the green and the olive. And so my, I've always felt happy and at home. And the light seems to suit my eyes um, in the Mediterranean. And that's where it began with her. And then appallingly, having turned away from this scene of squalor and uh, death, that's how it ended too. I, so she, I got my, that was my first view. Just of to give some context here, uh, what I read comes after your discovery <clears throat> that she committed suicide. Yes, well, I already said that my father was a, an honorable and brave and modest and thrifty man, and all of those things he was to a great degree. But um, he was 12 years older than my mother, and he rather bored her, I have to say. It was a horrible realization. Which she thought was the worst sin. And she thought, bored, as I do, that boredom is the worst thing of all, and being boring is the worst crime. And she, his name was Yvonne, which I always liked, when I was small, I thought it's a classier name. Uh, was so, rather, so my my English childhood yeah. was rather was generally rather sort of drab and grey. And um, Yvonne, well, it sounded French. Well, it is French. Um, she was very beautiful. She was interested in fashion. Beautiful pictures of her. Yes, yeah, she's book. lovely. She was lovely. And my the, the the wives of my father's brother officers tended to be. I hope I don't sound snobbish here, but they tended to be called things like Ethel <laughs> or Marjorie. Um, or Nancy or so. Yvonne, my mother was different. She was much more. She was just cut above. She looked different. And she would have liked to go to the theatre and have sharp and fashionable cocktail parties and smart little events. And it, she never really got any of this in my father. And so when, when she could, she left him. She left it too late and went off with a man who was not boring, who could quote poetry and was charming, a bit of a pseudo, actually, charmer, spoiled priest of the Church of England. But amusing. But um, alas, unlike my father, not thrifty, not modest, not honest, not brave, and probably, well, certainly, I think, bipolar. <clears throat> he, needed, he needed to die, and he wanted to take her with him, and they made a, <clears throat> they made a suicide pact and um, carried it out in Athens. She introduced you to him. She wanted me to approve, yeah. Did you? Well, yes, in a way. I mean, he was, he was, an, he was an appealing chap. I thought maybe a bit shallow, but not bad. Um, anyway, she, I couldn't, I don't think I would have dared say I don't approve, no. I, I couldn't have done that. I wish I had now. I could have warned her that he was unstable. Something a bit shaky about him, flaky. What's the word the children, my daughters use? Sketchy. Very good, very deadly word that, that people know right away. I, I, I could have, it's one of my regrets, I didn't say. And another regret was that you were not there to take her phone call. Yeah. Well, she, that's true. There was before answering machines and cell phones were common and when I went to Athens. And once I'd fought my way through all this stuff and that war warfare that was going on as well, I, the hotel, and once I'd done the forensic investigation and found she hadn't been murdered, which is what had they first had been same. reported. Uh, it was first reported that he'd killed her and then it was also at least three days I, I did think she'd been murdered. Um, and had to see all the photographs and the friends go, but this included the hotel switchboard record of her trying to call my number in London repeatedly and not getting, I was young in those days and why just, do you think I just she, got a job in London and I was, wasn't at home. Why do you think she had reached out to you? Well, she loved me. I was everything to her. She left to my, I mean, it was upsetting for my brother and my father because she left a note, which I finally found, took ages, but it was just to me. Um, and, that was very awkward, as you can imagine, to tell my, my, the, the remaining males of my family. I want to go back to her. She, was, she loved me and she was always on my side. It's a, it's a fantastic thing to have a beautiful woman in your corner from early childhood. Um, there's nothing who doesn't like, there's, spoil I you. I promise you there's nothing as quite you like said, it. Who doesn't spoil you, loves you, lets you go. Yeah. Doesn't spoil you for other women, though. She wasn't, she wasn't clinging, she wasn't over maternal, she never tried, she wasn't over protective. She wanted me to go away because she thought it would be better if I went to a proper school, a boarding school. 
she, she and your father had quite an argument about yeah. this. You overheard it. Picture, if you will, the young Hitch in his jammies. <clears throat> the top of the stairs, I suppose we've all done it at some point or another, you're, you're, you're overhearing a domestic dispute below. So you creep out, you eavesdrop, and the, it was about me. So I... Listen more attentively. More attentive. uh, it was a moi discussion. And she was saying that we'd have to scrape together the dough to get Christopher to a proper school, because none of my family had been to one, and eventually to university. And my father was saying quite practically and quite squarely the truth, which we didn't have the money. And she was saying, well, we'll find it from somewhere. And this is the bit I remember. <laughs> if there's going to be a ruling class in this country, Christopher is going to be part of it. So I thought, in my jammies, I sort of thought, yes. Did you, did you, understand, what and <laughs> did you, did you no. understand what ruling class no, meant? No, I didn't, I didn't but it, it sounded better than any of the other classes I knew. <laughs> <laughs> such as the ruled. Uh, I already knew enough about them. We, we were of that class already, thanks all the same. So, so the project was that CH would become an English gentleman, so you be the judge about how that, well that worked out. It was, um. I think it was a, I don't know, if, she, if they could come back now, I think they'd still be wondering when I was going to get a proper job of work. I think they might. But I knew that it, she was willing to do anything for me. And I for her. The scene you, you describe that I, I read, and which I think is actually very, in some way, uh, permit me to say, somewhat cinematic, um, the way you set it up uh, with the Parthenon in front, mm. um, brought me back to an early obsession of yours, which I happen to share, um, which you don't really talk about at all in this book, but I'd love to speak about it, speak about it with you a little bit, which is your interest in the Elgin marbles. Yes. And uh, I just recently, last week, was in Jamaica interviewing the Nigerian Nobel Prize, Wo Woli Soyinka, yeah, who, is, who you admire as well He's as I do. Great hero. And um, we were talking about retribution. And he believes that retribution sometimes needs only be symbolic, but that it can go beyond the symbolism, and we should just return, he said quite forcefully, all the stolen artifacts that are in museums to their proper owners, hmm. which um, is complex and certainly... No, it's not. It's, as he puts it, it's very simplistic. It's not complex at all. But it would deplete our museums. Yes, it would. But can I just tell my Soyenka story? Would you mind just in case it amuses people? No, Do you not? have in your heads, in your minds, ladies and gentlemen, a, a the image of Wole Soyinka, the great Nigerian noblest. Well, he's about six foot six, I'd say. Very tall. Um, and he has the most pure anthracite skin and a nimbus of white hair. Huge and he's amount. done an enormous amount of jail time and exile time in his native Nigeria. Always for the right, not just for the right cause, but for the right reasons. He's always given the best interpretation of that cause. He's a, his prison writings are among his best. He's a, one of Africa's really great heroes, I think. And I, was, uh, I got off a plane at the Cartagena Literary Festival a few years ago, and there was a greeter on the tarmac with a sign saying, Wolo Soyinka, Christopher Hitchens. So I thought, that's nice. And I walked up, and I said, well, okay, I'm here. And he looked at me, he looked up at the sign, and looked down and said, which one are you? <laughs> <laughs> so I thought, this is a sort of a rival, I suppose. Um, he's completely wrong about that. It's not to do with the national patrimony of our treasures. It's, I mean, after all... There are no Babylonians left. There are no Chaldeans. There are no Hittites, uh, for one thing. There really aren't any ancient Greeks either, if, you, if you're to be honest about it, or Romans. Um, and the countries of Africa are... I mean, the, we did return some stuff to Ashanti in Ghana because it really was the, the kingly treasure of their, of their monarchy. But it meant, in other words, it meant a lot more to them than it did to us. But, that should be very rare. The case of the Elgin marbles is a very simple one. Here you have the sculpture of the frieze of the Parthenon, a sculpture carved to tell us a single unified story by Phidias and his assistants. It's probably the Panathenaic procession. And it's a, it's, it's a single work of art, and it's been broken into two and exhibited uselessly and pointlessly in London where no one can tell what it's about. 
and separated from the building. It can't be returned to the building, but it can be returned to Athens. And a museum has been built to do that. And every other European country has given back their fragments of it. Um, I mean, if you like to imagine, say, the panel of the Mona Lisa having been captured during the Napoleonic Wars and sawn in two, as did happen to a lot of things. One half of the Mona Lisa is in the museum in Lisbon, and the other is in a museum in Stockholm. I think there'd be a general curiosity to see what the picture would look like if it was put together. <laughs> I hope so, anyway. Well, that's the case with the Parthenon frieze. It's as simple as that. And it wouldn't matter if the Greece was under Turkish occupation, as it was when the sculptures were removed illegally by Lord Elgin. The aesthetic uh, imperative is obviously the dominant one, the deciding one. I'm sorry to say, I, I don't I think I'm... And I'm sad to hear that Sohinka is uh, pandering to, or even conceding anything, to nationalism in, in museum building. I think that's an enemy of culture. And I say it with regret, because he's a, he's a, he's a giant. Nobody can be right about everything. Well, one can give it the old college try. <laughs> you, in some way, I, I, I see similarities between your memoir and the writing of Flaubert's Education Sentimentale. In some way, you're molding and putting together the private and the public. As you say, you've written a book around the context and the, bat uh, the, context and the battles of ideas. Um, it seems to me that you, you were the right man at the right place, at the right moment, nearly always during your lifetime. You found yourself lucky enough in historical circumstances to find yourself at a moment when something dramatic was happening. But even in, in the drama of ideas, in your early years at university, you studied with some of the finest minds. And um, I'd like to hear, I think it's, um, let me just check. I'd like to bring you back to those early years, if you don't mind. And if you could just play clip number two. Oh, what is this? What is it? On the set. Among Pelagian travelers, lost on their lewd, conceited way. No, number two, not number three. Sorry. Never known it to fail. If a man does do it, he does because he wants to do it. Because this is his personal human goal. Because <laughs> in this way, he achieves something which he, and not somebody else, at this it's moment louder. desires. If he doesn't do that, he's not a human being at all. He has no accountability. The whole notion of moral responsibility, which for Rousseau is the essence of man almost more than his reason, depends upon the fact that a man can choose. Choose between alternatives. Choose between them freely, be uncoerced. If a man is coerced, coerced by somebody else, by a tyrant, or even by material circumstances, then it is absurd to say that he chooses, and for Rousseau, he becomes a thing, a chattel, an object in nature, something from which no accountability can be expected. That, as some of you will know, is um, the inimitable Isaiah Berlin, inventor of the fox hedgehog distinction. Um, being rotund. Um, I used to be able to do him a bit. Um, we once sat together arguing about Marx, Karl Marx, and, on whom he wrote an incredibly bad book. Um, and he, I was studying the Oxford course called PPE, Philosophy, Politics, and Economics. And he was pretending that Marx was his student and how, how he would award points to Marx for this course. Said, well, I think, I think perhaps an alpha, I think pretty, almost certainly an alpha. An alpha for politics, yes, an alpha perhaps not, or alpha for politics. But very much a beta, beta minus for economics. And then perhaps, and then perhaps no, beta, beta alpha, beta alpha plus for, for philosophy. Yes. Um, I mean, I you agree. Say, yeah, I'm sitting here, I'm 19. This guy was in Russia and witnessed the revolution. He's the only person I've ever met who was an eyewitness to St. Petersburg in 1917. And he's grading Karl Marx for the course I'm reading at Balliol. <laughs> Ah, that, that was, yes, that did make you feel you weren't wasting your time. You, you I mean, you've been accused, you and I... Elf, elf, probably, elf. I mean, you've been, a, you've been accused, and not an accusation you will get from me, that this book um, is filled with name droppings of sorts. But I know, I know. I, I, and I, I, I should have left out all the interesting people. I yeah. Um, <laughs> as I said, I not, not an... 
I should have air airbrushed them. And why bother with the jokes they tell me or the anecdotes? I mean, it's just, as I said, it's like scraping acquaintance, isn't it? It's well, you, you write... Next time, I promise a more sort of austere account of things. Well, you, you, you write here, I hope that by dropping these names, I can convey something of the hidden, headiness of it. It might have been heady at any time, but in the 68 atmosphere, it chanced to coincide with other ferments and intoxications as well. And those days, you, you, you rubbed shoulders with these extraordinary figures. How do you think an Isaiah Berlin would view you today? Well, he was always very nice to me, actually. He would, he would drop me a line whenever he noticed an article I'd written, especially, of inevitably, or invariably, rather, if it mentioned him. Um, he once told me an enormous lie that I have in print that was later corrected in Michael Ignatiev's very hagiographic biography of him. I don't think he will actually be remembered as the great man he's thought of. Now, I don't think he has complete staying power. Because if you don't remember that voice and that style, as with Morris Bower and quite a lot of the so-called giants of Oxford at that stage, you won't. I don't say this to gratify his stepdaughter, but one who will, who I do remember, was uh, Sir A.J. Ayer, uh, Freddie, uh, the great philosopher, author of Language, Truth and, and Logic, who was also the senior member of our socialist society in Oxford, who's one of the great defenders of logic and reason and science against religion. He'll last, but a lot of them won't. You and he share something in common quite deeply, the sense of insecurity. Um, Freddie? No, uh, Isaiah Berlin. Berlin, absolutely. Berlin used to say all the time, and people thought he was joking, and I'm sure he wasn't, that he was overrated, that people thought his stuff was a lot better than it was. And he would say, long may this, long may this illusion continue. Long may it continue. And I occasionally read a praise for myself that I don't think I deserve, and it makes me very uneasy, yeah. Um, fraudulent? No, but um, not exactly, but there was a very great Scottish journalist and reporter when I was growing up called James Cameron, who um, he's still remembered by many people because of the extraordinary early dispatches he wrote from the Vietnam War for the Daily Herald, old Labour paper. But for, and for a wonderful memoir called Point of Departure, about the days of old Fleet Street. And I remember him saying to me once, and he wrote it too, he said, every time I roll the paper into the typewriter, you see how long ago it was, every time I do that, I think, today's the day they're going to find me out. And if you don't have a bit of that, if you don't think that there's something meretricious about success or celebrity, um, and that you ought to have stage fright every time you go on, because you shouldn't just become too used to it, then I think you probably are flirting with being a fraud. But being aware of <clears throat> the possibility that you might just be lucky is, is a good thing. And, and Berlin, to his credit, did have that. And he couldn't get people to believe him. As I said, you, you have been lucky. You have been struck been by good lucky. fortune. Yes. Um, since we're here in this library... Is you my luck about to change? Um, <laughs> not yet. Okay. Um, you, you have this wonderful line, uh, the lexicographer Wil Wilfred Funk yes. was once invited to say what he thought was the most beautiful word in the English language and nominated mange. Now, what is that? Because did any I, of you, I, here's a question, did any of you ever used to take the Reader's Digest at home? You weren't admitted even if you did. We used to. It was the most elevated reading in the house for a while. And a thing that grabbed me was um, a feature in it called It Pays to Increase Your Word Power by Wilfred Funk, who is one of Funk and Wagnall. And um, so there'd be a new word every... Well, 20 new words every week, and then there'd be three possible definitions of it, and then you'd have to pick what was the right one. I used to do it all the time. I loved it. I like all language games, as you know. And when he was asked his favourite word in English, he said... Mange, <laughs> which is you don't know? I don't. I, oh no, I, I it's read it, I read it's it the like, it's uh, the it's like the mange. it's the well, uh, bien sûr mange because it's the way that uh, the coat of a favourite cocker spaniel gets eaten away by disease. It becomes mangy. Mange is the the eroding, <clears throat> rotting 
living death of your fur. <laughs> I think that's a fair crazy of the situation. I think it's a rather so that good, was, that's good definition. What, yeah. That's what he picked, and uh, I hope it never happens to my own pelt. Um, I would say library. Um, yes. Among, I mean, there are several words I'd pick, but mange wouldn't be one of them. But mange is good because it's a loan word from Norman French, and so you can learn about why that is, and comment dit manger, etc. But... Uh, Library for me. You have lots to say about it in the in the in this passage. You yes. mentioned that library, and I'm but so touched to find about Keith. The terrible thing, though, is that Keith is too much a librarian's name, isn't it? <laughs> no insult to any of the staunch. I, I thought you would be Keith, able. To, Keith is somehow a librarian. Thought you would be able to help name. me get him, not no. him. No, no, no. I mean, I'll be there when Keith gives tongue on this. You you write that. Um, in, in your school, the blue-eyed small uh, boy, small for his age, and with rather feminine eyelashes, who is indifferent to sports and happiest in the library, is buggered. I mean, the library is a place that you have always loved. Yeah, not just Be as a refuge from sodomy, I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get that. <clears throat> get that out of the way. Well, which, by the, it isn't always, because you meet all kinds of characters in the library. <laughs> Have you been in the stacks here? The, the, what a question. <laughs> Have you? So that sounds like a Monty Python question, doesn't it? Have you? Oh, he's been in the stacks. <laughs> Bring it on. <laughs> you say this, which I find extraordinary in the education of young children, as I have. I am quite relieved to read this if ever I turn to you to know how to educate my own children. You say, perhaps two or three times a year I receive a questionnaire from some writer's organization or some writerly magazine asking me to name my formative books. Yes. Uh, the temptation to inflate the currency of the past is always present. It was when perusing the immortal Gustave Flaubert at the tender age of X, mm. what would you say, six, uh, that my eyes were open to in fact, I suspect that it doesn't very much matter what one reads in the early years once one has acquired the essential ability to read for pleasure alone. Voilà. And why, why is that so important? And is that missing, do you find, from your own students now? Yes. And one thing that's missing, I think, is what... Um, well, it's originally said by Mark Twain and then annexed for his own purposes by George Orwell is the good, bad book. Yeah. Uh, the book that can really inspire and elevate you, but you're later a bit ashamed to admit to the influence of. Um, Uncle Tom's Cabin is a very good example. In my case, um, How Green Was My Valley. An incredibly sentimental but brilliantly poetic account of life in a Welsh coal mining community at the turn of the 19th century. Um, absolutely absorbing and making a bridge between books for boys and books for men. Buildings are man, in other words, in its nature and also in its effect. Very important. I'd, I, I'd find it harder and harder now when I teach my class to find a book that they've all read, or all read voluntarily, as opposed to being... And even one that they might all have been compelled to read, like uh, Tony Morrison, I suppose, is one that they, they all feel they were made to read. But I used to be able to count on Salinger, everyone having read that. You can't be sure of that now or of uh, Twain, or even of uh, Fitzgerald. It's very, very difficult. So the struggle for a common discourse is hard I mean, it, it happened, uh, it's happening to you now. I, I remember a, a moment when I was teaching many years ago and I was teaching Bartleby the Scrivener and a student yeah. who always said something very interesting, but always slightly off. Um, I once in front of a large class asked him if he had read Bartleby the Scrivener and his response was, not personally. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, it, it, that's very good. It's in a Eng good, I gave him an A+, plus no, in because England, I mean, he'll in, go far, in, in I'm England, sure he has. In England, the answer would be, not as such. <laughs> <laughs> you've always it's a been, good sort of defensive dugout position. You've always been... Um, one who has loved playing with words, I think limericks in particular, have been something you've, you've liked and cultivated, whether it's... 
Yes. Maybe you, you might try a few even out on most, Even the most puerile stuff, you see, can build muscles in you. You learn a bit from it. You, you have to start small. Well, start, um, start small and... And with my friends, um, who I write this as emotionally about as I dare, um, Martin Amis being one, and of course, and Ian McEwan being another, and, and the great, the best at all these games, Salman Rushdie. Um, we started with some, some very scrabble level, but then I think it transcended itself. Uh, let me try to think. You know, you, talk, you come here, one talks with you about Balzac, Flaubert, Proust, and so forth. We'll go back. We can talk yes, about... Yes, yes, but, you know, but you know what the audience really wants is a little tincture of filth. Yeah. That's what no. they want. That's what they want. Filth and plenty of it. So, for example... We used to play a Pura game, which is take any well-known phrase or saying that contains the word heart. Okay, you've thought of one. Now take that out, put in the word dick. <laughs> so, um, dick break hotel. Um, bury my dick at wounded knee. Uh, <laughs> I left my dick in San Francisco. Uh, the dick is a lonely hunter. The dick has its reasons. It's just perfectly childish. I don't know why you're laughing at this at all. But, but you know, we'd pass them around, and every Friday, the lunch we'd have, we'd sort of see how we'd sort of try and polish it up a bit. And then it all gets worthwhile, because Woody Allen moves in with his daughter, his adopted daughter. And people ask him <clears throat> on the record, well, what are you doing setting up housekeeping with your kid? And he says, well, the heart wants what it wants. <laughs> and it, it makes it all worthwhile. Um, I chose the cleanest one on purpose. The limerick, the limerick is more literary because people think of it as a delivery system for filth, of course, which it's not, um, or needn't be. I mean, there is the young engine driver named Hunt, um, who was given an engine to shunt, saw a runaway truck by shouting out, duck, save the life of the fellow in front which was written by Robert Conquest, who also, you remember, ladies and gentlemen, the speech that Jacques gives in Act Two of, um, as you like it, The Seven Ages of Man, All the World's a Stage, All the Men and Women, Many Plays. You've got it? It's 24 lines, I counted them. <laughs> Conquest gets it into seven, into five. Um, seven ages, first puking and mewling, then very pissed off with your schooling, then fucks, then fights, then judging chaps' rights, then sitting in slippers, then drooling. <laughs> That's it. There's nothing left out of that. Wendy Cope, one of the great women poets of our time, has done The Wasteland, and I don't know if I can do it. If I can, can I recall it? Um, whoa. I'll think about it while I tell you another one. This Calvin's theory of um, predestination. There once was a man who said, damn, it is born in upon me, I am, a creature that moves in predestinate grooves. I'm not even a bus. I'm a tram. <laughs> okay, in April, this is the wasteland, I think I've got it. In April, one seldom feels cheerful. Hot sun and black dust make me fearful. Clairvoyance depress me. Commuters distress me. Met Stetson and gave him an earful. <laughs> There's the whole failure of Chia Sedes in one go. <laughs> but then there is the young hooker from Crewe <laughs> who filled up her pussy with glue. This is what you're waiting for. <laughs> um, and said with a grin, since they'll pay to get in, they can pay to get out of it too. <laughs> your, your that, I think, is smutty. Yeah, your, your mother uh, had great ambitions for Don't you. Don't mention my mother just right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, that, that was a natural yeah, it's segue. A segue. Um, so coming back to, to Yvonne, she had great ambitions for you. And I, I suppose, I don't know if she imagined this, but uh, I suppose by taking you out of your class and putting you on a, in another class, branding your tongue in a different way, as it were, yes. and for you to speak... I don't know if it's upper class, but you speak... No. No. No, if you meet a genuine member of the upper class, you'd, you'd be instantly able to tell the difference. 
I don't know quite how they do it. Well, but it can't, it's very hard to say. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> you begin to doubt everything you've ever said. Really? Well, well, one of the things... Uh, <laughs> I think one of the, the, the great descriptions in, 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 in your memoir is of New York and your love of actually this very area of New York. Yes. You, you speak, uh, for, for instance, you write here on uh, Mid-Manhattan, you say, I simply found myself somewhere in Mid-Manhattan, Midtown Manhattan, looking up at skyscrapers, but the illusion was accompanied by a feeling of profound happiness, a sensation of being free in a way I had never before known. I could read so many of, of these wonderful passages where you say, um, Evelyn Waugh was in error when he said that in New York there was a neurosis in the air which the inhabitants mistook for energy. There was rather a ten, I, I love this, there was rather a tensile excitement in that air which made one think, made me think for many years that time spent asleep in New York was somehow time wasted. Whether this thought has lengthened or shortened my life, I shall never know, but it has certainly colored it. And why did you move to D.C., for goodness well, sake? <laughs> because I, because I, um, because New York was too rich for my blood, and I wasn't getting any work done. And that's the honest truth. Um, it was precisely that. Even however late I went to bed, I'd wake up early. Now, there were too many distractions. I was, I was quite young then. I didn't have any responsibilities, didn't own any property, didn't have any children. And God knows what might have happened if I'd stayed. And when I, so I, I returned to the faith of my fathers and the Puritan upbringing that I'd had, of the, the feeling that one must apply oneself and um, go somewhere boring uh, and s severe and put myself between the shafts and teach myself to work hard and alone. And that was a good decision too. But, but the main decision was to move to the United States. I didn't, after that, I didn't much mind where I was. And I didn't know this then, but the, the feeling I had when I was young that I had to become a writer, and the dreams and the yearnings that I felt at around the same time, the imperative of moving to the United States, I couldn't have explained either to anybody, but I, they, there they were. And I now, all these years later, realize that they were <clears throat> aspects of the same thing that in order to do the first thing, to become a writer, I, had to, I would have to come here. And one of the things you're most proud of is becoming an American. Yes. Why? Well, because after um, various alarms and excursions in Beirut and Baghdad and Afghanistan and elsewhere, some of which I describe in the, in the book, um, after the terrible assault on American civil society in 2001, and especially on my two beloved cities, Washington and New York, I began to identify very strongly um, with the United States and to rather despise myself for <clears throat> having a, the cushy billet of American children, an American wife, a European Union passport, and a platinum green card that never ran out. I, mean, it was, I somehow thought I was cheating on my dues. And I began to identify much more with, with America and its struggle against um, theocracy and barbarism and to resent the people who were slandering it for doing so and who still do. So I thought I'd take the next step. Has it been painful for you to see so many friends you once upon a time had leaving you for some of the beliefs you now hold? No. That's nothing to the much nicer friends that I've made instead. Well, in particular, no, I'm perfectly serious, Paul. Um, I, know, I, I know you no, are. To the, friend, to the friends I've met, among, especially among Arab and Kurdish Iraqis who now have their own country and their own elections, their own constitution, their own press, and in the Kurdish case, their own self-government in the northeast of the country, I'd far rather spend time with them um, than with the people who wish that they were still the private property of the... or who acted as if they didn't care, as if they were still the private property of the Saddam Hussein crime family and its um, ownership so of So your opinion has not changed in the least? To the contrary. The, contrary. the liberation of Iraq 
was the most arduous political argument I ever had to take part in, but it was the one where I had the least respect for the people who were taking the opposing view, and where I'm, I'm absolutely appalled to this moment that they won't admit how wrong they were. You know, that was, that was uh, something I'm, I'm extremely proud of. And of course, uh, of course if, you, if you take part in a, com a combat, a conflict like that, you can expect to lose friends, but don't forget, you can expect to make them too. And the ones I've made are people who are liberation fighters. That can be better than some member of moveon.org, say. I sometimes worry that you get entrenched in your beliefs. Uh, Don't. Strike it from your list of anxieties. <laughs> <laughs> you have enough on your plate, man. <laughs> entrenched is where I'd hope to be, just as some people, it's funny, some people used to think that it was horrible to be called predictable. Even now, no one ever says that about you, intending it as a compliment. But I don't see why it's so pejorative. I, I, I'd like to think that anyone who cared to know what I think, or was really took the trouble to be interested, would, if asked, well, I wonder what Christopher's position is on the continued existence of the Saddam Hussein regime, would say, well, come on, I mean, what, what do you, hell would you think he would on think? On the recent attack, Israel, on the flotilla, I just wonder what you think about that. Oh, well, that's a micro event, but it's a catalytic one for, ma for more major ones, I think. It's a small event in itself, but as with everything to do with Israel, it raises the question of the legitimacy of the Israeli state. That's, that actually, I think, and I say in my longish chapter that I hope everyone will read, and by the way, if you'll buy it, I'll sign it, um, on the Israel and the Jewish question, is the difference. Israel will never be a normal state. The, the desire for normality will continue to elude it. It will never be normal or safe to be a Jewish either. And I hope it never is, by the way. I say, I quote Leo Strauss as saying, the Jews, the point of the existence of the Jews is to show that there's no redemption. There is no salvation. That's what the Jewish people prove. Um, so, by all means, people can say, well, it shows there should be no occupation. I've been saying that for 30 years, um, that the occupation of Gaza was a crime to begin with and was ended too late to do any real good. You can say all that. Uh, but what the people on that flotilla are saying is we are the, and the, and the euphemists and supporters are saying, is we are the advance guard of the friends of Hamas and the friends of Jihad. How they get them call themselves called activists, I don't really quite know. It's quite clever to get yourself just called that if you're a member of a group like International Answer, contributed a lot of the, which are the American friends of North Korea, the American friends of Saddam Hussein, the American friends of Hafez al-Assad, the American defenders of the Islamic Republic of Iran. Well, if they should be brave enough to stand by their principles and not be just told that they're activists. Some people feel that um, you... And, ha, and the guests, the honored guests of the, of the, the thuggish government of uh, Mr. Erdogan, who just a few weeks ago said, if anyone mentions the Armenian question in public ever again, I will expel all the remaining Armenians from Turkey. In other words, don't bring up the last genocide or I'll hurt them again. This man is an out-of-control thug. And he's posing as a defender of the rights, human rights of the Palestinians. It makes me want to throw up things I've forgotten ever eating. <laughs> Some people feel um, that you misbehaved when you wrote the obituary of Edward Said. In what respect? In, in more than one way, but in one way... In, or in writing it at all, you mean? In writing the obituary you wrote. Well, you should enlarge that in some way you were, you were criticizing him at a moment when he was dying? Uh, no, the obituaries are not written when people are dying. No, of course, right. We've been through that. We have. <laughs> he was an ex-professor at that point. Excellent. Do you think you were, you were tough on him? Sure. Yes, as I was, I should add. In, in other words, I'm <laughs> saying that 
in the chapter that you write at the end of your book, which brings us to Israel in some form or fashion about yes. Edward, you perhaps you rewrite the last part of your friendship in a sweeter light than the one it was in at the end of of his own life and well, your I, relationship I mean, with him. That one can't be the judge of how things appear to other people, but when I say that um, at the end of his, towards the end of his life, Edward um, referred in print in a Saudi-sponsored magazine in London to something that I had written about the liberation of Iraq and described the position taken by the author of these words as racist. That's not sweetening. Uh, bring me an ounce of civic good apothecary to sweeten that. Um, he was too fastidious or perhaps too nervous to actually put my name. He didn't say me. He just said, quoted the words. He didn't call me a racist to my face. But that didn't make it any better. And I thought, well, you have to take a thing like that seriously. I wouldn't have a racist for a friend, so I presume... He doesn't want me for one either. It would be a terrible thing if a word like that lost its potency. So I, that was a froideur, which I hugely regret. Um, and I would submit to anyone's arbitration whether or not those words could have that appropriate term attached to them. I would accept your verdict if you like, but you don't seem to be suggesting that. No, I'm, I'm suggesting that some friendships you describe in the book uh, have, have been lost and have in some way been lost in particular because of the great change that happened in you. I mean, you changed your mind from left to right and stayed there. This is, it, you will not, you will excuse me for saying, Paul. That's facile. Um, of course, I, I forgive you completely. Good. <laughs> Um, well, you don't have to, but I mean, I, 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 I ask your pardon. What is surely consistent, even if it's only, uh, even if consistency isn't that great a virtue in me, is that I have an absolute loathing for theocracy in all its forms. Uh, the, most, the most repulsive, at least in the sense of being the most violent form that theocracy takes at the moment, is, is Islamic Jihad. Follow me closely here. Edward though he was a secularist and a non-believer, and not a Muslim in any case, was brought up as a Christian, could never quite bring himself to condemn this in round enough terms. If he would ever condemn Islamism, he would say it's terrible, but it's really the fault only of American policy that it exists. He couldn't condemn it ding an sich, as we say, as a thing in itself. And after a while, this reluctance, I knew this would happen. It led to a breach between us. I thought it had to be condemned for its own sake and, and in its own name. And so um, the breach eventually occurred. But it wasn't initiated really by either of us. It was just something that had to happen. And yes, it's an infinite cause of pain to me that it happened towards the close of his life. But that's, that wasn't controlled by either of us. Well, I, I've tried to write as carefully as I can about that and my very long association with him in the, in the book. And I don't think I've dishonored him in any way. But I don't think that friendship uh, requires the concealment or um, suppression or euphemization of differences of principle. For those people who want to get a, a, a sense of you, uh, should, they, should they turn very quickly to page 333 and 334 of the Proust questionnaire? Is, do you think that will enlighten them or just amuse them? I hope both, perhaps. The Proust questionnaire is supposed to be accidentally revealing answers, right. I think. It's, it's, I don't know which one you have in mind. I, I'm going to, you can choose and pick whichever ones you want to read. I'm amused to, to have you read them because just... A couple of weeks ago, I was interviewing Bernard Pivot, uh, yes. the, the French um, talk show host who, for, Ap about 20, Apostrophe. Apostrophe, about 25 years every Friday, interviewed uh, 
people from around the world, from Solzhenitsyn to Nabokov to Duras, etc., uh, Levi Strauss, it's, and uh, had actually never been interviewed himself, but ended every apostrophe, which was watched every Friday by five and a half million French-speaking people. It's quite a feat. Um, he finished every apostrophe with uh, the Proust questionnaire. Actually, what was interesting in speaking to him when I asked him why he accepted to be interviewed when he said he had never been interviewed, he said, I'm 75 years old, I've never been interviewed, and you're not French. First time a Frenchman believes it's an advantage not to be French. But um, <laughs> choose a couple, just some that might, well, get people to get your book but also uh, get people to know a little bit more about, your st about you that I haven't been able to sess out. You probably all know that my colleagues at Vanity Fair every month subject some well-known person to the... It's not a questionnaire um, designed by Marcel Proust, as some people think. It's, um, it's that twice in his life Proust, who loved these kinds of things, agreed to answer a questionnaire. And we have his answers. And so it's a digest of that. And so in a chapter called Something of Myself, I thought I might risk it. Um, well, I'll, I'll, do, I'll take the page you leave open. Uh, what do you regard as the lowest depth of misery? Just to give you an idea, Proust's reply was to be separated from Mama. I think that the lowest <coughs> depth of misery ought to be distinguished from the highest pitch of anguish. In the lower depths come enforced idleness, sexual boredom, and or impotence. At the highest pitch, the death of a friend or even the fear of the death of a child. Where would you like to live? In a state of conflict or a conflicted state? What is your idea of earthly happiness? To be vindicated in my own lifetime. <laughs> I'm now reading this as if it was written by somebody else. Um, <laughs> To what, do you think? to what faults do you feel most indulgent? To the ones that arise from urgent material needs. Who are your favorite heroes of fiction? Dennis Barlow, Humbert Humbert, Horatio Hornblower, Jeeves, Nicholas Salmanovich Rubashov, Funesh the Memorious, Lucifer. Who are your favorite characters in history? Socrates, Spinoza, Thomas Paine, Rosa Luxemburg, and Leon Trotsky. Who are your favorite heroines in real life? The women of Afghanistan, Iraq, and Iran who risked their lives and their beauty to defy the foulness of theocracy. Ayan Hashi Ali and Azhar Nafizi as their ideal feminine model. Is this enough? No, a bit more. Who are your favorite heroines of fiction? Maggie Tulliver, Dorothea, Becky Sharp, Candy, O, but Bertie's Aunt Dahlia. Your favorite painter, Goya, Otto Dix. Your favorite musician, J.S. Bach, Bob Dylan. Um, your favorite virtue, an appreciation for irony. Your least favorite virtue, or nominee for the most overrated one, faith. <laughs> Closely followed in view of the overall shortage of time by patience. <laughs> there. The rest they will read later on tonight. What is your favorite flower? Garlic. <laughs> <laughs> in, in closing, I'd like us to listen to um, the third clip we have here, which is something that you often do as you travel the country. And since America has mattered to you so much, I'd like for us to listen to a poet who describes what you do fairly well. On the set. Among collated travelers, lost on their lewd, conceited way to Massachusetts, Michigan, Miami, or L.A., an airborne instrument I sit, predestined nightly to fulfill Columbia Geese and Management's unfathomable will. <laughs> By whose election justified, I bring my gospel of the muse to fundamentalists, to nuns, to Gentiles, and to Jews. And daily, seven days a week, before a local sense is jailed, from talking site to talking site, I'm jet or prop propelled. Though warm, I welcome everywhere. I shift so frequently, so fast, I cannot now tell where I was the evening before last. 
Unless some singular event should intervene to save the place, a truly asinine remark, a soul-bewitching face, or blessed encounter full of joy, unscheduled on the decent plan, with here an addict of Tolkien, there a Charles Williams fan. <laughs> Since merit but a dunghill is, I mount the rostrum unafraid. Indeed, for damnable to ask if I am overpaid. Spirit is willing to repeat without a qualm the same old talk, but flesh is homesick for our snug apartments in New York. A sulky 56, he finds a change in mealtimes utter hell, grown far too crotchety to like a luxury hotel. The Bible is a goodly book I always can peruse with zest, but really cannot say the same for Hilton's be my guest. <laughs> Nor bear with equanimity the radio in students' cars, Muzak at breakfast, or, dear God, girl organists in bars. <laughs> and worst of all, the anxious thought, each time my plane begins to sink and the no smoking sign comes on, what will there be to drink? Is this Amelia where I must? How grey and greenish, how infra dig. Snatch from the bottle in my bag an analeptic swig. Another morning comes. I see, brindling below me on the plain, the roofs of one more audience I shall not see again. God bless the lot of them, although I don't remember which was which. God bless the USA, so large, so friendly, and so rich. <laughs> Well, I ask my students to consider um, the following. T.S. Eliot, Thomas Stearns Eliot, left St. Louis, Missouri and tried to make himself into an Englishman and succeeded in becoming an Anglo-Catholic, um, a snob, um, an anti-Semite, and a royalist, at least, and to some extent an Englishman, though people used to laugh at the way he wore bowler hats on in the wrong way and on the wrong days. And Winston Hugh Auden, coming from Yorkshire, wanted to transmogrify himself into an American and succeeded at any rate in becoming a gay St. Mark's Place New Yorker, which is a start. And I ask my students to answer the question, which, of, which country, which culture got the best of the bargain? And I think there's no question that America got the best of that bargain. And that, in case you didn't know, ladies and gentlemen, is, is Auden reading his poem on the circuit about his travels around the United States, which I was privileged to hear him, him read for the first time. Actually, I say read. He would always recite his poems, even after a decanter of gin. He would never read from them. He needed no prompting. He could, he could simply go to the, usually the um, pulpit. He liked to read in Anglican churches. And... Um, declaimed them, as it were, and I heard it in Great St. Mary's Church in Cambridge in 1966. And it was one of the, one of the many things that contributed to my increasing stirring uh, of desire to, to see um, North America. So you couldn't have ended on a more perfect note, and I don't know where you found that, but that was brilliant. And Thank that's you very much. Sounded. Thank you. Christopher Hitchens. Thank you very much.